Well, good morning and greetings in the name of our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He is risen. This is the last Sunday of the Epiphany season this year, and it's Jesus Christ who is the expression of God's compassion toward us. He gives us hope. I'd like to read Psalm 147, the first 11 verses. And in this psalm, this great psalm, you hear the hope that we have in our, in our Savior. But listen to what he does and what he's, how he sees us at the very end. It starts, praise the Lord. How good it is to sing praises to our God. How pleasant and fitting to praise him. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the exiles of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines the number of the stars. He calls them each by name. Great is our God and mighty in power. His understanding has no limit. The Lord sustains the humble, but casts the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make music to our God on the harp. He covers the sky with clouds and supplies the earth with rain. He makes the grass grow on the hills. He provides food for the cattle and for the young ravens when they call. His pleasure is not in the strength of the horse nor his delight in the legs of a man. The Lord delights in those who fear him, who put their hope in his unfailing love. Amen. Amen. As Michael plays this prelude, I pray that you would look at that silent prayer and read it, pray it, and then may the Lord richly bless you today. Amen.
beginning in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. How lovely is thy dwelling place, O Lord our God, for the day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. It is good to praise the Lord and make music to his glorious name. We shall proclaim your love and faithfulness in the morning. We'll take a time of silence for personal reflection. Sometimes our words and actions show how we are salt for the world, but then come those moments when we lose our flavor and our way. If, if we, we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins. Let us confess our sins to our God so we might be restored and forgiven. Great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called the children of God. It is God's desire that we be holy as He is holy. But if anyone does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only ours, but for the sins of the whole world. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He does not treat us as our sins deserve. What good is it if we say we love all people, but give special treatment to a few? God, God calls us to love others as deeply as, deeply as we love ourselves, ourselves with, with no, no strings, strings attached. attached. What good is it if we say we want God to show mercy toward us, but are quick to judge others? God, God calls us to forgive our sisters, sisters and brothers, to, to let mercy triumph over judgment. judgment. You ask us to speak out against injustice, and we whisper because we're afraid someone might hear us. You ask us to see the pain and poverty around us, but we close our eyes. You tell us that everyone and each one is created in your image, yet we persist in noticing the differences between us and others. We, we stand, stand before, before you, you saving, saving God, God, stripped, stripped of, of our pretensions and pride, pride. For nothing we do or say or do not can be hidden from you. It is true. The word of God is living and active, sharper than a double-edged sword. It judges the attitude and thoughts of the heart, exposing us for what we are. Great is God's mercy to all who call upon him. There is a righteousness that comes from God through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. God presented Jesus Christ as a sacrifice of atonement for sin, and so all who believe are justified freely by His grace. You are forgiven in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for the reading of the lessons. Our first reading today comes from Isaiah chapter 40, beginning in verse 21. Do you not know... Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood since the earth was founded? He sits enthroned above the circle of the earth, and its people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy and spreads them out like a tent to live in. He brings princes to naught and reduces the rulers of this world to nothing. No sooner are they planted, no sooner are they sown, 
No sooner do they take root in the ground than he blows on them and they wither, and a whirlwind sweeps them away like chaff. To whom will you compare me, or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls forth each of them by name. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. Why do you complain, Jacob? Why do you say, Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord? My cause is disregarded by my God. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. This is the word of the Lord. Our second reading comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 9, beginning in verse 16. Paul writes, For when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast, since I am compelled to preach. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. If I preach voluntarily, I have a reward. If not voluntarily, I am simply discharging the trust committed to me. What then is my reward? Just this, that in preaching the gospel, I may offer it free of charge, and so not make full use of my rights as a preacher of the gospel. Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone, to win as many as possible. To the Jews I became like a Jew, to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak, to win the weak. I become all things to all people, so that by all possible means I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in its blessings. Do you not know that, a ra- that, I, that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize." Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike strike a blow to my body and make it my slave, so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified from the prize." This is the word of the Lord. As you're able, let's rise for the reading of the gospel lesson. The gospel lesson is from Mark chapter 1, beginning at verse 29, is the basis of our message for today. As soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they immediately told Jesus about her. So he went to her, took her hand, and helped her up. The fever left her, and she began to wait on them. That evening after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up left the house and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him. And when they found him, they exclaimed, Everyone is looking for you. And Jesus replied, Let us go somewhere else, to the nearby villages, so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. 
This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated for the singing of the message hymn. mercy and peace may multiplied unto you from our risen Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. Let us share the text that's printed for us this morning. Jesus, Jesus replied, replied, let us go, go somewhere, somewhere else, else to the nearby villages, villages so, so I can, can preach there, there also. That is why I have come. So he traveled throughout Galilee preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. Almost 2,000 years ago, when Jesus walked this earth, he began preaching in the village of Capernaum. In the middle of his sermon about God's grace, a man possessed by a demon interrupted Jesus. The haunted man pointed out to everyone that Jesus was the Holy One of God. I mean, I could see the man standing there and pointing to Jesus saying, I know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. Have you come to destroy us? You could just see that in your mind. Because the demon knew that the Messiah had arrived. He believed it was the final judgment. It was not. The demon did not know that the true reason for the arrival of Jesus Jesus had arrived to fulfill the promise that was made to Mary and Joseph. He will save humanity from our broken commandments and defeat the power of Satan. As soon as they left the synagogue, Jesus and his disciples went to the home of Peter and Andrew. Peter's mother-in-law was ill with a fever. Jesus walks into the room, takes her hand, and she's healed. She felt so good that she got up and served a meal. On that day, there were two healings in one day. So what did people get out of it? Did they say, wow, this is God's son? And did they agree with the words of the demon-possessed man just a few moments ago? No, they did not. 
Even Jesus knew that his purpose was more than just healing people. So do you know your purpose in life? Do you know your congregation's purpose and why we exist? We are here to carry on the work of our missionary God. He has given us the Holy Spirit to empower us to tell his story. Now, during World War II, there was a Jewish concentration camp in Hungary. Hundreds of prisoners were enslaved there in this compound, and in this factory, it processed garbage into alcohol, which then could be mixed with gasoline. One day, everything changed. Allied bombs leveled the factory. All work was canceled. At least that's what the prisoners thought. Surprisingly, the very next day, they were marched out of the factory as if nothing had happened. They were ordered to shovel a great pile of sand into carts and deliver the carts of sand from one end of the factory to the other where the factory had once stood. The next day, the process was repeated all in reverse. The same pile of sand was moved back and forth day after day after day after day. Slowly, the prisoners realized that their future had no future. One man broke down in tears and was dragged away. Another started screaming, and he was beaten until he was quiet. One individual, a veteran of three years in the camp, ran toward the electrified fence. Prisoners shouted a warning. Guards demanded that he stop. He didn't. These first of the living dead, soon joined in their madness by many others. Men went mad because their lives had no purpose. They discovered that life without purpose was empty. And that is why very early in the morning, before everyone else was up, Jesus left the house and went off to a solitary place and he prayed. Healing people was important, but it was not his purpose. All the gospel writers tell us that Jesus healed thousands, but he did not heal everyone in the land. Listen to the words of Matthew. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about him spread all over Syria. And people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon-possessed, those having seizures, and the paralyzed. And he healed them. Large crowds from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across the Jordan followed him. The miracles were acts of compassion, and they grabbed attention so that the people could then hear the message of a loving God who was offering mercy and forgiveness to his wayward children. His message was consistent. To the men standing around with stones in their hands, he said, he who is without sin may throw the first stone. They all left. You and I are all prodigal sons and daughters who've been invited to return home and enjoy the offer of grace and mercy. So early in the morning, in his conversations with his father, I'm sure Jesus was reminded by his father of God's promise to Adam and Eve and Abraham. The mission was clearly spoken by Peter in Acts chapter 4. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. Our God's a missionary God. Already in the Old Testament, He was calling people. He was always a missionary God, seeking the lost, offering forgiveness to Adam and to Eve and their descendants. God's plan was to use a special people to tell the good news of salvation. And he calls Abraham. Abraham was a pagan. 
until God called him. And God said to Abraham, I'm going to make your descendants into a great nation. I will bless you and I will bless them because I want all people on the earth to be blessed through you. The rest of the Bible is a story about how God would accomplish the task of blessing all people so their broken commandments might be forgiven just as he forgave Adam and Eve. The tragedy of the Old Testament is that the Israeli people at that time kept forgetting the universal scope of God's promise. They became preoccupied with their own history. And over time, it caused them to begin to look at their laws and their rules and then begin to boast in their rules that they had created. For they had created a privileged status and they felt that they were immune from God's judgment. But the prophets kept coming and the prophets kept reminding them that they were to be a light to the Gentile world. That is why Jesus told the story of the Good Samaritan. It infuriated many because the overly self-righteous Jew would not even walk on the same side of the street or enter a Gentile house. In the small town of Capernaum, it didn't take too long for the news of Jesus and his miracles to get out. It got out because every small town, the news just gets out. That day, people heard that the miracles were being performed at Peter's house. No appointment needed. No embarrassing physical. No sitting on a cold doctor's table, looking at all that shiny, painful, cold, threatening, stainless steel instruments. No gown <laughs> that won't stay shut. No blood pressure check or cholesterol check. No blood sugar test. No prescriptions. No copay. Just come in and zip. You're healed. You're better. Before sundown, Peter's doorway was crammed with ailing people. His foyer was filled to the brim with the lame, the blind, the crippled, the possessed. It must have been an unusual parade. And I'm sure there were some who came just for the show. We are told that Jesus had compassion on them. He healed them. And the word kept spreading. But they did not come to hear the words of salvation from the preacher that the preacher was sharing. Their hope was on that immediate need. The only purpose in their mind was to just, hey, wrap up that family member, uh, put him on a stretcher, and then... Head off to Capernaum. When they arrived, Jesus was gone. Even the disciples didn't know where he went, and so they started looking and searching. And when they found him, they said, everyone's looking for you. Watch how Jesus answered. He said, well, let us go to a nearby village so I can preach there too. Did he say so I can heal there too? No, he did not. So I can preach there. Preach what? Well, we just heard Matthew say he went around preaching the good news of salvation of the kingdom of God. The good news that God has arrived. Not only can your body be healed, but your sins can be forgiven. And that's exactly the point Mark is getting ready to make in the very next few verses. Some friends brought their paralyzed friend to town, but the place was so crowded, so they went up on the roof and they took the top off the roof and they let their friend down to where Jesus was standing. And what was the first thing that Jesus said? Come on, you know, you know, your sins are forgiven. When Jesus met a woman at the well, he preached. When he met a rich man or a leper, he preached. To the big crowds on the shore, he preached. To the disciples in the boat, he preached. He preached that his father, the creator, was on a mission to bring salvation. Sins forgiven. Eternal life restored. Peace in your heart. No fear of God's wrath against your broken commandments. Because God had chosen to nail them to the cross of Jesus and left them there. 
Jesus left heaven and actually entered the world he created. John writes, he came to that which was his own, but his own did not recognize him. He made his dwelling in our midst, and we saw his glory. Paul tells us that Jesus humbled himself by taking on our human nature and lived our lives, endured our temptations, felt our hurts and pains, and then took our broken commandments on his shoulders to the cross where God judged each believer holy, without blemish, free from accusation if you continue holding on to your faith in Jesus. That's the good news he preached. And that's the good news we hear. After the resurrection, Jesus met his disciples in the upper room and he gave them the Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit that he possessed as part of the Trinity. And on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit actualized himself in a powerful and visible way. And Jesus told his disciples that they should do the same. They should go out and they would be able to do the same miracles that he did. And they were simply now going to be his voice in the world. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When the Holy Spirit indwells in each believer, there is going to be love for the lost and your heart will ache. When the Holy Spirit indwells each believer, there's going to be a desire to serve others. All we do is to live and imitate Jesus. It is going to be the Holy Spirit that convicts the sinful person that we talk to. It's not our words that will do the conviction. It is the Holy Spirit that enables blind eyes to see the spiritual truth about Jesus when we talk about him. It's not our words. It's the Holy Spirit that enables us to repent and believe. And it is the Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from a stone grave and will raise us as well. Jesus has commissioned all of us to go into the mission field. And it's probably right next door as we live and love our neighbors. There was a great story on the news this morning. I'll have to save it for another day about how a Christian took care of a neighbor's yard and shoveled three foot of snow out of their driveway and that family was not a Christian. They couldn't figure out why it was done. It's a great story. No one asked. The Bible tells us that our God's a missionary God and all the evangelism that we get involved in, all the storytelling about Jesus we get involved in is going to be involving spiritual warfare. And that's why last week, Paul tells us to put on the shield of faith and the righteousness and gird yourself with the word of God. There was a young missionary who came to a tribe in Namibia. After preaching the gospel and telling them about Jesus for a number of weeks and months and how he lived and what he did, the Namibians stripped him and stopped him and said, no, wait, we know this man that you're talking about. He lived with us. The young missionary was very confused because his agency had told him that he was the very first person to come and to witness to these people in the India. The, well, he said, when, when, when did this person live with you? And they said, he lived here five years ago. And the missionary said, well, I'm talking about Jesus who died and rose from the grave 2,000 years ago. And they said, no, no, no. This man lived among us. He became one of us. He spoke like us. He came to look like us. And we'll prove it to you. And so they took him to a grave where they showed him the tombstone and pointed to the man's name. It was only the name they knew him by, Reverend. 1897, 1963. It was the gospel without words. My friends, listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit to speak to your hearts and then go and do the good works that God has prepared in advance for you to do. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty and gracious Heavenly Father, we ask that your Spirit would mightily lead us every day and keep our ears sensitive to those around us and our eyes ready to see 
the work you want us to do. And then motivate us to follow through and to share your love and to be servants where we live, work, and play. In your name, Jesus. Amen. We continue our order of worship with the singing of the next hymn. confession of faith in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give thanks to you for sending your Son, Jesus Christ, that through him the good news of salvation has been made known. By your word, rescue us from every evil of body and mind and soul. Lord, in your mercy. O oh Lord, we give joy to those who preach the gospel that many would be saved in every nation and every city. We thank you that we share in the blessings of Christ, and we pray for those who are searching in the wrong places. Draw them to you through our actions and the words of the gospel. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Heavenly Father, give us the endurance that comes from your Holy Spirit, that husbands and wives, parents and children would love each other and love you through thought, word, and deed. May the words of our mouths 
and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing to you, Lord, in your mercy. O oh, Father, you created this world and its foundations and continue to reign over the powers of nature and the rulers of the earth. Graciously preserve our land, its produce and its businesses. Bless and guide our civic leaders. Grant us peace in our lives and guide our country according to your will. Lord, in your mercy. O oh Lord, you promised in Psalm 147 that it is you who covers the sky with clouds and supplies the earth with rain. We humbly ask you to bring more rain, to bring grass on the hills and snow in the mountains. Lord, in your mercy. O Lord, your Son is the great physician of body and soul, at whose hand demons and diseases must turn away. We bring before you those in need of healing, including those that we name in our hearts now. Lord, in your mercy. Father, where there is forgiveness of sins, there's life and salvation. We thank you for the sacrament of communion, that the blood of Christ, which atoned for our sins, may make us whole, strengthen us against every spiritual attack of the devil, turn us in love toward our neighbor, and preserve us in body and soul to life everlasting. What a gift, Lord. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen. Let's sing the closing hymn together.
Psalm 147 were, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, alleluia, without end. I pray the Lord richly bless you this week. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Amen. Amen.